Welcome everyone to the third Delaware Project RDoc ABCT webinar. Today's webinar will address the topic, how can RDoc inform suicide intervention research and treatment? Uh, I'm Tim Fowles, I'll be moderating our discussion today, and I'll introduce you to our panelists in a minute, but first I want to tell you a little bit about the Delaware Project vision and why we're tackling this uh, problem from this particular angle. Uh, the Delaware Project is really aimed at lifting the burden of mental illness, and that's felt nowhere more keenly than in the case of suicide. And the primary way that we do that is by translating mechanisms of pathology into active treatment ingredients and integrating intervention science through all of the stages, basic science to intervention development, efficacy trials to effectiveness, all the way to dissemination implementation, and then communicating uh, amongst these different, uh, you know, former, formerly siloed areas of intervention science to uh, inform um, the larger picture and help, again, lift the burden of, of uh, mental illness. And not only are we trying to do this as scientists, but we're trying to train the next generation of <coughs> intervention scientists to do the same. Uh, today we have uh, three panelists who will uh, focus on this kind of translational vision in the case of suicide prevention intervention. Our first speaker, speaker will be Dr. Stacia Friedman Hill from uh, National Institute of Mental Health, uh, after which we'll hear from doc, Dr. Matthew Nock uh, from Harvard University, and finally from Dr. David Brent from University of Pittsburgh. Each of these eminent uh, scientists deserves their own lengthy introduction. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to let their projects and their work speak for themselves. Uh, keep in mind that there is a Q&A feature on the webinar. You'll see that on your screens. And we encourage you to type in questions as we go along. We're not going to take questions on the fly, but we will reserve about uh, 20 to 30 minutes at the end of the webinar uh, to address those questions the best we can. Without uh, further, further ado, um, Dr. Friedman Hill. Thank you. So I'm Stacia Friedman Hill. I'm a program director in the Division of Translational Research at the National Institute of Mental Health. Research on suicide is a priority for NIMH because suicide is a leading cause of death in the United States. In 2017, <coughs> more than 47,000 Americans died by suicide. Suicide is the 10th leading cause of death overall in the United States. It's the fourth leading cause of death in individuals aged 35 through 54. And shockingly, it's the second leading cause of death in individuals aged 10 through 34. In addition to deaths by suicide, um, suicide may, has an impact um, even greater. Uh, 1.4 million Americans, um, adult Americans in 2017 attempted suicide. 3.2 million adults made suicide plans and more than 10 million adults had serious thoughts about suicide. <clears throat> More alarming are the um, trends in suicide rates over time. Since 1999, suicide rates have increased by 33%. Now, as a program officer at NIMH, one of my responsibilities is to identify research which, which can make significant impact. A typical R01 grant funds five years of research. Well, in the last five years, suicide rates have increased by 10%. So it's very sobering to realize that as NIMH staff identifies research for investment, and as investigators um, conduct that research, um, that the ground is continuing to shift. So obviously we need to speed the rate of discovery of new interventions and improvements to existing interventions. Given this urgency, um, NIMH staff thought about ways that uh, research on suicide might be guided by the NIMH Research Domain Criteria Framework, or RDOC. So RDOC is a research framework, um, and its goal is to 
um, identify um, psychological and biological processes which um, are the underlying causes of mental health and mental illness. It um, is organized into six functional domains and it encourages investigation across multiple levels of, um, of investigation. For example, from genes and molecules to behavior and self-reports. The RDoC framework also um, acknowledges the influence of neurodevelopment and the environment. Now, it's not set in stone. The RDoC um, framework is something which is a tool. It's still evolving. An example of that is the sensory motor domain was just added a few months ago. Um, it's also not intended as a schema for clinical diagnosis or to um, replace the GSM. Within the six functional domains, um, experts have identified from existing uh, research literature constructs that are associated with each domain. And if you drill down further into the RDoC matrix, um, uh, you can see, for example, for the construct of acute fear, um, acute threat or fear, um, that there are units of analysis. These are associated with different levels of investigation. So in a way, you might think of this as a menu that you could use to design experiments to gain understanding into the, um, the neural and um, psychological mechanisms of uh, mental illness. One way that our doc has been used um, is to gain better uh, schemas for classification of, of patients. So I'm going to show you, here is a, um, a figure from just one study that we have called BSNP. Um, this happens to be a study of psychosis. It used a transdiagnostic approach, recruiting subjects who have bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. Um, and then employing RDoC, um, there were objective, uh, measurable units of analysis for neurocognition, uh, neural measures such as EEG or neuroimaging, uh, genomic analysis. And by measuring all of these things, a classification emerged uh, which is closer tied to the etiology of the disorder. Um, it eliminates some of the heterogeneity that's seen when you classify based on symptom lists. Um, and because it was based on these psychological and biological processes, it's closer to understanding um, the biological basis of um, disorders. Um, we think this could be useful for suicide research because we know that people who have suicidal thoughts and behaviors probably um, represent multiple etiologies and pathways, and RDoC might um, help us identify um, biotypes of suicide risk. But we want to go beyond classifying patients or understanding mechanisms to actually being able to treat patients and to mod by modifying those mechanisms. So our doc goes hand in hand with an emphasis on experimental therapeutics. This is um, a guideline for discovery of interventions or improvement of interventions. So in traditional clinical trials, subjects are often selected on the basis of clinical symptoms. At the end, we would evaluate whether or not the symptoms changed by the intervention. But the problem with that approach is that we weren't, it doesn't elucidate how the treatment actually works and it doesn't really give you a blueprint for what you should do next. Instead, a few years ago, we began to emphasize experimental therapeutics and research which is staged. So in the initial stage, we <clears throat> emphasize um, target investigation. So the targets, which you might call a mediator or a mechanism, will be uh, proposed from the RDoC framework. Um, uh, they do not necessarily have to be biological. They can be psychological processes. It could be behavioral or cognitive or even interpersonal processes. The second stage is once we've identified targets that we think are involved in a disorder, we need to show that um, our proposed intervention engages the target. So um, will, our engage, will the proposed intervention um, show a change in the target? And can we identify and quantify the parameters for optimal engagement? And then lastly, in the third stage, we have a clinical trial where now that we have identified a target, we've shown we can engage it and what the optimal parameters are, we're gonna test it to find out um, does it actually change clinical outcomes and is it relevant to a clinical problem. The benefits of using RDoC and an experimental therapeutics approach 
is that it's streamlined, efficient discovery. We learn whether our results are positive. They provide us information on optimal dosing and timing. We also learn from negative findings. It rules out mechanisms and we just don't go down that pathway again. Um, it also is the basis of precision medicine. Um, the understanding that we get through this approach gives us better diagnostic tools and it also gives us a better understanding of which interventions work for which patients. So you might be thinking, this is, takes a long time, this can be a slow process. I've already told you that there's a sense of urgency. Don't we have um, interventions which we know already work? So that's true. We do in fact have um, uh, um, interventions for suicide which are evidence-based. For example, our toolkit could include cognitive behavioral therapy. So previous studies have shown that um, suicide attempters who um, engaged in CBT for 18 months had reduced reattempts by 50%. We could also employ dialectical behavior therapy, which has also been shown to reduce reattempts. Um, uh, an older uh, form of intervention is caring contacts, which follows patients after uh, release from treatment. Um, in our contacts made either through letters or phone calls or emails. Um, in some studies, this has also been shown to be efficacious and particularly low cost. So we do have interventions which are effective, but these were developed before NIMH emphasized experimental therapeutics. And as a consequent, points, we, don't actually, we may not actually understand what the targets of these interventions are or what the mechanisms of action are. And so what I want to um, hope to convince you of is that it matters and there are some reasons why we might want to understand um, the mechanisms of action. So um, for starters, um, if we understood the mechanisms of action, it would facilitate precision medicine. We can use deep phenotyping to identify for a given patient what is the best treatment option. Um, this may also, understanding the mechanisms may tell us something about timing. When's the best time to intervene? How, does it, how can we sequence with uh, potentially other treatments as well? Um, we may find that there are multiple targets um, and we may need multiple interventions and um, the precision medicine approach can tell us maybe something about um, how we might combine different therapies. We could also use it to improve existing treatments. Um, the whole process of target identification and showing that we can engage target also gives us objective measures of progress. Um, and that's important because sometimes uh, patients might not be aware um, that, uh, of changes. And if our um, objective measures are maybe uh, potentially more sensitive, it can prevent the situation where we abort an intervention prematurely. It might be working and we just weren't aware yet. With objective measures, we'll know that. Um, I, um, the objective measures also allow us to compare different types of interventions. Um, and uh, whether we can engage the same targets in a different way. Um, and they also um, help us understand um, why um, uh, people who are not responding, um, maybe one reason why they're not responding. And then it can also help us uh, to improve delivery. So one p uh, potential example of that would be um, if you could use, for example, um, physiological uh, um, monitoring um, via biosensors, you might know how to, when was the best time to send a caring letter or when a therapist might want to initiate in the moment uh, coaching. So I wanted to show um, how you might um, go about designing research studies which could test the mechanisms underlying existing treatments. I'm going to focus just on DBT and I'm going to focus actually on just one type of skill which is worked on in DBT. So um, distress tolerance is one of sort of four areas um, that DBT uh, skills training is focused on. So let's consider distress tolerance and let's look at it in the light of the RDOC framework. So I've put up the domains and constructs and identified some things which we might um, hypothesize are important for distress tolerance. So for example, acute threat um, or arousal um, are things which seem reasonably uh, to be involved in distress tolerance. But there are other things such as attention, 
um, maybe reward processes. And in blue, I've shown you some other areas which we um, suspect interact. So social communication, for example, um, we know that social interactions might be the trigger for a distressing situation. I'm going to focus only on acute threat in the interest of time, but David Brent and Matt Nock are going to talk about some of these other RDoC domains um, in their talk. So if we drill down into acute threat, we see a list of measures. Um, and again, we can use this to guide some research on um, how we might look at the mechanisms um, by which DBT skills um, affect change. So things that we could measure from here would be cortisol. We might look at the, um, the hypothalamus or the amygdala. We might measure heart rate. Um, we, um, and we might want a, a laboratory-based task, such as the tree or social uh, stress task. <clears throat> So here I have a figure from um, a just published review of um, stress response, and I thought this was a great um, uh, image that really shows a model of, of uh, stress response systems, and it also um, has a, a great mapping onto our dog. So in this model, the, um, the HPA axis, the um, hypothalamus, pituitary, um, and adrenal glands are key to stress responses. There's a cascade of hormones, um, and they act on things such as um, heart rate, um, inflammation, um, and the model also um, acknowledges that there can be influences from interpersonal stress, there can be distal risk factors, for example, on childhood adversity, um, and also, importantly, the role of um, neurodevelopment. This is a system where um, these circuits are changing um, over, uh, particularly over adolescence. So if we go back, um, if we look at, now we have some targets, we have neural um, areas, um, areas of the brain which we can look at, we have things we can measure like heart rate or uh, cortisol, um, and we can also decide whether to do this in a naturalistic environment or um, to induce stress in a laboratory environment which will allow us to control um, some of the experimental factors. So the Trier social stress task is one that um, has been used in a lot of studies to look at distress tolerance. Um, there's lots of variations of this, but they have common elements. It involves a patient um, or a, a participant um, um, coming into the lab. There's a, a baseline period of rest instructions. This is followed by a stressful situation. Um, generally, it's a, um, a job talk in front of a panel um, who can be neutral or offer negative feedback. And then it's followed by a recovery period. Um, and the key to this uh, paradigm is that you can uh, take measurements before and after the stressful period. So for example, um, it, uh, typically you can uh, collect saliva to measure uh, cortisol, you can measure heart rate, maybe pupil dilation, you can do some cognitive tasks, maybe a stroop task or a task of cognitive control during this resting period. Um, and then you can repeat all these measures during the recovery period and so you can see what is the effect of the stressful um, event. And so here's an example of a study that used the tree or social stress task um, and collected um, measures of, of cortisol from saliva. Um, what I want to um, bring your attention to is that this study included healthy uh, controls um, and also um, uh, so participants whose uh, parents had a mood disorder. So the healthy controls, their parents did not have a mood disorder. And with the um, offspring of the um, parents who have mood disorders, um, those offspring could either be non-suicidal, they may have a history of a suicide attempt, or they may have had some suicide-related behaviors. For example, they may have made an aborted attempt or had severe ideation, which resulted in a, um, an ER uh, visit. So the key things here that I want to show you is that in the healthy controls here and the non-suicidal offspring, um, over here are the points measured before the stressful event. These are the points here that are from the recovery period. And you can see that there's similar patterns of increases um, um, in cortisol during the recovery period. Um, similarly, if you look at the offspring who have behaviors but uh, not, complete, uh, not attempts, um, and you look at the recovery period, they look similar to the other two groups. <clears throat> 
But one thing here is that if you look at the offspring who had made um, previous attempts, you see that overall there's a reduced level of cortisol both during baseline and during the recovery period. So um, this measure can identify um, individuals who have made previous suicide attempts who may be at risk for suicide, and it can even distinguish them from those who may be have um, ideation but not have made attempts. Here's a similar study, again, using the TRIER um, social stress task, measuring cortisol. This uh, was able here to find a different pattern between um, individuals who had um, brief periods of ideation versus those who had, um, whose ideation tended to be longer and, and continuous. And then you might be thinking, well, in a typical clinical setting, it might be difficult to measure cortisol. So I wanted to be sure to show you that there are other physiological measures um, which are, um, may also um, be biomarkers. So this is a study um, of um, females who had a history of a mood disorder. Um, and um, this looked at heart rate variability. And here you see that um, individuals who had a previous suicide attempt, there's a difference in their heart rate variability versus non-attempters. So I want to bring this all together as I um, um, I'm start to conclude my talk. Let's consider how these translational experiments um, might tell us something about the mechanisms by which DBT or other interventions work. Um, we consider just distress tolerance and just acute um, threat. Um, but we identified first targets. So the cortisol measurements, um, the, um, we identified a target, which was um, uh, brain regions and mechanisms for acute fear. We identified, we had units of analysis, such as the cortisol measures or the heart rate measures, which in turn allowed us to quantify um, and potentially you could combine this with um, an intervention and see how the intervention affected these um, units of analysis which are measurable. By measuring these, um, we could potentially also personalize medicine. So a precision uh, medicine approach would, for example, um, look at how much distress tolerance was an issue for a particular patient. Um, and if we looked at multiple constructs, we could then start to put together patient profiles um, to see what are the most important areas or the most pressing areas that we want to work on with our interventions. Um, these biomarkers for the stress response um, can also be used to track uh, uh, per progress in real world settings and even identify um, high risk states. Um, uh, even prior to um, a patient's awareness that they're um, in a, um, a high distress state. Um, and they allow us to um, potentially consider whether combining therapies and quantify the boost you might get from combining pharmacological interventions with um, DBT, or maybe how we want to, what's the optimal way to sequence uh, learning DBT skills. <clears throat> So I focused in this talk on how we can use RDOC in an experimental therapeutics approach to understand our existing interventions. But um, more importantly, we can use RDOC to discover new targets and new ways of engaging targets for novel interventions. So I want to close by um, uh, letting you know that the NIMH has multiple grant mechanisms which are um, tailored for different stages of experimental uh, therapeutics and that program staff is um, happy to help you um, identify which grant mechanism um, is the best for the research that you might be doing. <clears throat> And then lastly, I'm hoping that I can show you that um, the new approaches to science that um, NIMH has been emphasizing um, are intended to speed um, um, the pipeline and find science to service. And hopefully that um, by speeding this up, we can begin to actually turn the tide and reduce suicide rates. So I wanna thank you for listening. And I wanna thank my colleagues for helping me put together this talk and for all that they do every day. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Friedman Hill. We'll next hear from Dr. Matthew Nock. And I do want to mention that these, uh, this webinar will be archived and posted online. Um, so you'll have access to it later on.
All right, thank you so much. Thanks to everyone for joining. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Matthew Nock. I'm a professor of psychology here at Harvard University. And with the brief time that I have, I want to talk a little bit about some ideas about why people kill themselves. And in particular, I want to talk about the potential role of RDoc in the development of better explanatory models. And by better, I think we mean better for our field, suggesting that our current exploratory models are insufficient and inaccurate at uh, understanding, predicting, and preventing suicidal behavior. So before getting started, I want to briefly uh, thank the sources of funding who supported some of the work I'm going to present. Most importantly, NIMH, because they are here listening. I also want to note that I have no conflicts of interest, and I want to acknowledge uh, just a few of the really important people who contributed to uh, some of the work I'm going to share today. So in the brief time that I have, I'd like to talk to you about four things. First, I want to go very briefly through some theories about suicide, the history of uh, theories about suicide in about one minute, and then talk about where we are currently. I then want to identify some key gaps, as I see them, in our understanding of suicidal behaviors. I then want to talk about what I see as the role of RDoc in potentially helping to better understand suicidal behavior. And I'll conclude with some ideas about needed directions. So again, in about one minute, I'll, I'll fly through early conceptualizations of suicide. The thing I wanted to draw out here is that from our earliest models of suicide, or I should say our earliest models of suicide, were really interesting and held really uh, strong psychological explanatory power. So if you think back to uh, work done by Durkheim over 100 years ago, he described suicide as resulting from a, a breakdown in a person's social integration, for instance. We later saw theories about suicide as resulting from anger at another person turned inward, leading one to destroy one's own body. Suicide resulting from problems of cognitive rigidity. If you can't think of lots of solutions to a problem, you might uh, be more likely to uh, choose suicide as an option. And Schneidman, famously in our field, talked about suicide as an escape from intense psychological pain. The idea that people who want to die by suicide don't necessarily want death, they're trying to escape from some intolerable, some perceived intolerable circumstance in the same way that someone might uh, jump out of a, a window to escape a burning room. So these early models made a lot of sense, I think helped clinicians understand and helped others understand uh, how and why suicidal people might be struggling, although they were admittedly overly simple in their focus, focusing on one variable or two variables at a time. With the development of DSM-3, as we all know, and, and the incorporation of the research diagnostic criteria, we saw much greater reliability in our diagnostic system, but many argued that that came at the expense of understanding, and I think that this influence uh, affected the study of suicide as well and our understanding of suicide. And over the past few decades, we've come to see people, I think in large part because of studies showing that about 90 to 95% of people who die by suicide have a prior diagnosable mental disorder that has led many people to think about suicide as a complication or a consequence of psychiatric or mental disorders or of a specific disorder. It is true that mental disorders have a strong association with suicide, but that doesn't help us really explain how or why people become suicidal, or how or why people with mental disorders become suicidal. Steve Hyman and others have argued that this focus, this, that the modern uh, somewhat myopic focus on the DSM has created epistemic blinders that's really impeded our progress. And Hyman and others have suggested this has been the case for the understanding of mental disorders. I would argue that this has really limited this focus, and this intense focus on the DSM has limited our understanding of suicidal behaviors more broadly. Some may disagree with that perspective, and you are, of course, welcome to do so. Uh, as W. Edward Deming has said, in God we trust, all others must bring data. And so I brought some data to try and uh, to see whether this is the case in our field. And I want to do this briefly by pointing to uh, a, a recent meta-analysis done by Joe Franklin, assistant professor at Florida State University. What Joe and, and friends did was look at every study that could be found trying to predict suicidal outcomes over the past 50 years. And when you look across the past 50 years of research, and you've been studies from, those, from the different decades, been in the first two decades together, what you see is, if you look at what are the top five types of risk factors examined, it turns out that the top five risk factors in the research literature are the same for the past 50 years. We look at sociodemographics, internal, internalizing and externalizing DSM symptoms, prior self-injurious often behaviors, and negative life events. And those top five are the same five over and over and over again. And in fact, in seven, about 75 to 80% of all prediction cases, 
meaning all analyses done over the past 50 years in the literature, we've been looking at those five types of risk factors. What has the outcome been? If we look across our effect sizes over the past 50 years, and they're plotted here on the, on the y-axis, on the vertical axis, this is odds ratio, so we'd expect higher odds ratio, meaning stronger predictive power. Are our odds ratios increasing from left to right? Are we getting better and better at identifying predictive factors for suicide attempts and suicide deaths? Sadly, we are not. This is a pretty flat set of bars. If anything, it looks like it might be falling slightly. And this shouldn't be surprising, right? If we're, if we're looking at the same predictors and we're using the same methods over and over again, it is perhaps not surprising that we're getting the same results. So we need to do things a little bit differently. So this is where we are currently. Not, not a glorious state of affairs, but it's where we are in the study of suicidal behaviors. So one way forward might be to think about, well, what are the gaps? This is one quick slide. I apologize, it's quite busy. Uh, I'll walk through it very quickly just to highlight what, what I see as some of the key gaps here. The first is we need novel risk factors, as I just described. The next four key gaps, as I see them, are we need to better understand what factors predict the transition from thought to action. Only about a third of people who think about suicide actually make an attempt. And most of the risk factors that we've identified are actually predictive of suicidal thinking, but not of who makes the transition from thought to action. We need to get much better at predicting that transition. We also need to better understand how to combine information about different risk factors. That meta-analysis that I mentioned shows that the vast majority of studies have looked at one risk factor at a time. We need more complex models. We also need a better understanding across levels of analysis. Many of us focus on subjective mental state, looking at self-reports or uh, self-report questionnaires or interviews. Others look at physiological responses, others brain circuitry, others genetic association. These are all important, but we need to start working across these different levels to put together uh, a deeper picture of, of why people think about suicide and why they make suicide attempts. And for predictive and clinical purposes, we really need objective markers of risk, and we need to better understand short-term prediction of risk. The vast majority of our research has looked at prediction periods of a year or longer. We really don't have a good understanding of how or why or when a person's going to transition to a suicide attempt short-term, which clinically is what we really, really need. What framework could possibly help us address these different gaps? What I would argue is that the RDOC framework that Stacia just did a, a really wonderful job walking through and describing is really well suited to address many of these gaps. You are, if you're tuning in, likely familiar or getting familiar with the um, research domain criteria. And you now know, if you didn't know, there's a new domain in town, the sensory motor domain. Uh, so we have you now six domains here. And the goal in this area of the field, as I see it, is to use these domains and these constructs to better understand the occurrence of suicidal thoughts and the transition to suicidal, be suicidal behavior. So how can we do that? How can we impose some structure here? Well, if we think about all of the theories of suicide that I described earlier and, and subsequent ones up until today, up until today we can, if we look across these different models, these theoretical models, they start to look like they're models that have some common elements to them. And many models that are more simple and look at one factor or two factors or three factors, one might even think of as random selections from this pool of common themes. Uh, common themes throughout models of suicide, and this hopefully will, will resonate to the clinicians in the room, people who are suicidal tend to express that they're in psychological pain, that they have trouble experiencing pleasure, that they're hopeless, they're isolated, they have poor arousal and regulation of their arousal, problems with sleep, problems with agitation. These are pretty big fuzzy constructs that actually map on quite well, if you think about it, to uh, constructs within the negative valence system, positive valence system, uh, cognitive systems, taking hopelessness, for instance, having negative expectations about the future. There's some really interesting basic science work on prospection, the ability to think uh, about and simulate the future, and it's by Dan Schachter and Dan Gilbert and Randy Buckner and others, showing that the ability to prospect, to think about the future, relies on memory and flexibly recombining information from a person's past to, to generate thoughts about the future, hopelessness may result from problems in these more basic areas for, for which we have a good underlying uh, understanding. Social isolation reflects perhaps problems in social processes and arousal and agitation and regulation uh, map on pretty cleanly to these uh, other domains. 
And so if we study R dot constructs as more basic components that make up some of these uh, pieces of the theory, this might help us, these theories might, this might help us get better traction in our understanding. So how do we move forward? How do we create uh, better explanatory models, more effective, more accurate, more predictive, uh, more powerful models? RDoc, I would argue, can help us do that by building a framework for um, hypothesis testing, but more importantly, for model building. And through this lens, we might uh, benefit from thinking about suicide as the result of the interaction of dysfunctions in multiple evolutionarily adaptive domains, with these RDoc constructs uh, representing adaptive constructs, adaptive uh, things that a person must do to survive, but maybe there are extremes or deviations in them that can lead to suicidal behaviors. And I'll talk more about that in the next slide. And so what I would encourage those who are uh, psychological scientists to do, many, many of us have a, a, a tendency to think about RDAC as a uh, inherently biologically reductionistic system that goes right down to genes and to cells. I would argue it doesn't need to. If you look at the domains, uh, you look at the constructs under the domain, these reflect what's happening right now in psychological science and in basic science and in basic psychological science. So we might think, think of this as a, a, a map for uh, better connecting with our basic science colleagues. So what do I mean by this earlier statement? Much of what we do as humans, it's not the vast majority of what we do, is aimed at adaptive functioning and at surviving and, and thriving in our world. We need things like a strong stress, stress response to prepare us for flight or for taking off. We need to have implicit cognition to reason about and understand and move about the world. We need to experience psychological pain from an evolutionary perspective. If you're part of a group, you're part of a tribe, and you're, you break away, you're isolated from that group, some kind of alarm bell should go off in your head saying, this is uncomfortable, this hurts, get back into the group, otherwise you're going to die. You're going to starve, you're going to be frozen, you're going to be eaten by uh, a dinosaur. We should have a tendency to escape from aversive um, situations. If a room is burning, we should want to jump out of the room, we should want to get out of there. We should be able to think Flexibly, we should be able to simulate the future. It's going to help us survive. We should be able to make effective decisions. We should have a fear response. And in some instances, we should be able to override that fear response. All of these things are adaptive. And we all experience these on a continuum. We all vary. These things are dimensional. Right? What I'm arguing, what I'm suggesting is, if we're too high in some of these dimensions, some of these traits, and too low in others of them, this might lead us to have an increased risk of suicidal thinking, of suicide attempts, and then suicide death. I'm not proposing that these are the eight, or that any one or two or three of these are the, are the right interactions, but rather that we think about these, these constructs, these, these psychological traits, as ones that are connected to uh, basic psychological science and from which we can draw and study, draw from and study and better, to better understand suicidal outcomes. For each of these constructs I mentioned, there are well-developed, validated, objective measures for these constructs. And for some of them, thinking across units of analysis or levels of analysis, we have, in the case of decision-making, for instance, connections to an underlying uh, neural circuitry, which itself is connected to an underlying uh, genetic uh, structure. So we can start to uh, move across units of analysis with this approach. So what might this look like, and, and how can we move forward in this direction if it's a, one that we think is fruitful? Uh, one thing that we can do, and we should do, is look to see, well, what is our starting point? What do we know about our doc constructs and suicide? And I'm part of a group with Kathy Glenn and Egan Kleiman and Christine Shaw and others that recently received a small amount of funding from NIH, who generously supported this, this mission of trying to better understand our doc and suicide. And one thing that we've been doing is going through the past literature to identify, to find quantitative studies that have measured our doc constructs. I cut to the chase, there aren't a lot of them, and measure and, and or quantify the links with suicidal outcomes to ultimately develop a searchable database that people can use to visualize these associations and, and, and all scientists can use to study them. Uh, as a first step, we took data from the earlier meta-analysis by Joe Franklin and friends that I mentioned and said, well, what prospective studies do we have that measure R dot constructs and predict suicide ideation, attempts, and death? For, for um, To be brief, I'm going to show you just what we found for predictors of attempt. So these are our five um, RDoC domains. One thing to note is just the number of studies. This is a small number of studies from the hundreds of thousands that have been done. Only a handful of studies made the list in terms of looking at RDoC constructs. 
Most of them focus on negative valence and social processes, not many in these other domains. In terms of effect sizes, negative valence has a, a strong odds ratio, as we would expect. The others are a little bit below. But we see a pretty strong signal for arousal regulatory systems. Small number of studies, but a uh, fairly large odds ratio. Yes, this is a, a place outside the lamppost that light that we should be looking. And this group concluded the paper, I'll just read because this really nicely sums it up. The ODOC framework provides a novel and promising approach to suicide research, but relatively few studies of suicidal behavior have fit within this framework. So future studies have to go beyond the usual suspects of the risk factors that I described earlier to understand processes, psychological processes that combine to lead to this deadly outcome. And I want to conclude by talking about how we might do that by developing and evaluating objective measures of psychological constructs of interest from the RDOC construct list or outside it. As Stacia uh, importantly mentioned, this is a, the RDOC framework is a living, breathing, thriving uh, list. And then to develop treatments that target these constructs that seem to have important associations with suicidal behaviors. So I want to give one quick example. I know my time is just about up. I want to focus on the idea of suicide as a state. Schneidman has famously, famously said, and I think I, I really like this quote and this approach because myself having interviewed thousands of suicidal uh, people, it resonates really strongly. Uh, Schneidman describes suicide as being pushed by pain in every instance he's seen, and that suicidal thoughts and actions represent efforts to escape that pain. Well, how do you study escape other than to ask people, people who are suicidal and have made a recent suicide attempt say the reason they did it very often is to escape from intense situation. Well, how do you study that? I want to briefly describe uh, some really beautiful work done by Alex Milner, who's a, a research scientist here at Harvard, who's been interested in this idea of quantifying escape. And what he did was develop a, a brief behavioral task that measures people's decisions to escape from aversive states. He did this by drawing on a really rich, deep uh, body of literature uh, based on reinforcement learning, and he developed a task in which people are exposed to many trials, they learn from feedback they get, they have to make subsequent choices, and what he did was use a computational modeling approach to quantify how people make choices, how they make decisions moving through time based on their context. The hypothesis here is that it's normal, it's adaptive to act to escape from an aversive condition. If you're in a burning room, it's normal to act to try and get out of there. But escape, you know, escape this escape bias might be especially strong in people who are suicidal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My screen went blank. Organizers, do I, am I still on? Do I have you? Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. you're, you're still on. We'll stay tuned while you work on okay. technical stuff. Can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, everything disappeared for a moment. I don't know why. I'll go especially fast. Maybe that's like the, uh, the Oscar is getting ready to cut me off. So in the task, mm -hmm. a person has to make a decision to, uh, to act or not to act, to press a space bar or go or not go. And they do this, seeing four types of images. Mm -hmm. And in some conditions, there's a, a, a really aversive noise playing. And the way, the way to shut that noise off is either to go on some trials or to not go, to do nothing. In other instances, there's no noise playing, and if you go, that noise doesn't come on. And in other instances, if you don't go, that noise doesn't come on. And so you get these trials, you don't know what the right thing to do is, but you've got to learn to go or to not go. What he found is that in conditions when the noise is on, normal, normal, non-suicidal, non-people non, um, without a mental disorder have a tendency to go to escape. If there's a noise, an aversive noise playing, most of us have a tendency to want to push a space bar, to do something to escape. If there's no noise playing, most of us have a tendency to no-go. We learn faster. If, if things aren't broke, don't fix it. Don't act to escape. He then wondered whether suicidal people show this stronger go bias to escape from an aversive context. So we compared non-suicidal people to suicidal people. The bars on the right, I will ask you to ignore for now. Those are the same as the previous bars. What I want to highlight is in, in among people, the, sorry, the ones on the right were psychiatric control participants, the ones on the left, psychiatric patients who are also suicidal, those folks show this strong go bias. When they're in an aversive context, they have a really strong bias to act to escape that 
aversive context, much more so, more so than non-suicidal psychiatric patients. And for suicidal people for whom they were in a neutral state, they have a tendency not to go. They struggled to learn to do something to, uh, um, to change that state. So this is good support for the escape theory of suicide, and this, more importantly, has a strong link with uh, basic science on learning and decision-making computational modeling, providing nice traction for work in this area. The next steps in this area are to test this escape tendency in situ out in the world with, with smartphones to see if people's escape tendency as it increases their suicidal thoughts and likely their suicidal behavior increases, and then to develop and test training that targets this escape tendency to see if we can drive it down. So in conclusion, what we need to do is move beyond tests of DSM disorders as predictors, consider the RDAC framework as a way of addressing many of these existing gaps, develop and test objective measures of common psychological elements like uh, escape decision-making, and then, once we find strong associations, target these with novel interventions to try and drive these behaviors down. Thank you so much for your time. I look forward to any questions people might have. Thank you very much, Dr. Nock. We'll next hear from uh, Dr. David Brent. And again, we are collecting questions via the Q&A, so please go ahead and post those, and we've reserved time at the end to, uh, to address those. We've already gotten a few, but uh, looking forward to a great discussion. Um, go ahead, Dr. Brent, whenever you're ready. Can you see this now? Yes, yes, we see it. Looks good. good. All right. So, and now you can hear me. So, uh, I'd like to first uh, thank NAMH for inviting me to participate and for my uh, co presenters for really elegant talks. Uh, I know I learned a lot. And um, what I'd like to do now is talk about what are uh, just uh, t try to take apart one really central intervention that's used in almost all evidence-based treatments for the prevention of suicidal behavior, which is a safety plan, and to talk about the some convergent evidence and uh, alteration of social processes related to self and suicidal behavior, and then finally to talk about how I, a better clarification of these targets can support the search for more effective um, interventions. And you can think about safety planning as trying to reset the balance between distress and restraint. And you heard from Matt about the, and, and also from Stacia about the importance of, of uh, arousal and, and uh, agitation and mental pain as a contributor to uh, suicide. And in the short run, the goal of a safety plan is to help people uh, avoid acting on those experiences. And uh, so in uh, simply a, a, a safety plan involves looking at what are the triggers for suicidal behavior, figuring out ways to avoid those triggers if possible. And if you can't, you figure out ways to cope with those triggers either and three of the mechanisms that we're going to talk about are distress tolerance, which Stacia also discussed, reviewing reasons for living, and, and reaching out. And on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see uh, some work of Barbara Stanley that a brief uh, safety planning intervention, a one-session intervention, uh, significantly cut the rate of suicide attempts um, in follow-up on people seen in an emergency room. So you can see that this element of, um, of uh, intervention is effective. So one of the things that occurred to me as I began to think about this is there's a lot of aspects, little different domains and constructs of, of RDOC that you have to um, activate for even the simplest um, component of intervention. So first, you have to know that you're upset, uh, distressed, and that involves something, a construct under the social process domain. Then you need to access working memory to figure out a strategy to respond. You need to uh, go into cognitive systems to select the, the right uh, response. 
And, you know, hopefully that response uh, will have an effect on the um, negative valence system and arousal, which in turn uh, feeds back to the um, sense of distress. And uh, reasons for living, this is where you think about reasons why you wouldn't want to kill yourself. And um, so, again, you would go into working memory. Uh, you would then um, update and, and um, can, you know, consider some different options. And one of the most common reasons that people give for reasons for living are, number one, they don't want to hurt their family, and which may activate um, the social process uh, construct related to affiliation and attachment, but they also have moral objections to suicide and may fear uh, some negative consequences, and that may actually activate the negative valence system. And then, um, in addition, you're having a situation where you're considering uh, reasons why you want to live. There may be things that you're looking forward to, which may activate the positive valence system which in turn to, together can um, reduce your suicidal risk. And finally, the issue of reaching out to others. Again, you begin with the sense of distress. Uh, you select a response, which in this case is to um, attach to somebody else, and that in turn um, provides um, feedback to the negative valence system and arousal and hopefully reduces suicidal risk. Now, I'd like to transition to another um, aspect of RDOC, which has to do with the uh, concept of self in the, uh, under the uh, social domain. And in specific, something referred to as self-referential thinking. This is where um, it's the tendency for a person to think about material or an idea in relation to oneself. So, for example, if you ask a suicidal person to think about funeral, they're much more likely to say my funeral or think about their own funeral as compared to somebody who's not suicidal, who may think about funerals in the abstract or some historical experience thereof. And there is evidence on multiple levels of an alteration in self-reference and self-association in suicidal behavior. And it ranges from the way people use language. And in this study by Dichad Hurry, um, it was a very elegant use of um, natural language processing to identify uh, more common use of self-referential language in people who uh, were moving from um, groups that discussed mental health issues to groups that discussed suicidal related issues. And the more self-referential the language, the more likely they were to make that transition. And work that Matt has been involved in has identified, you know, associations between self and death that are uh, stronger in suicidal people than they are in non-suicidal people. And, and uh, this is another example of an altered um, uh, association between self. Um, and finally, there's a recent study by Alarcon that looked at uh, adolescents, uh, some of whom were suicidal or had made suicide attempts, while they were looking at faces that morphed from um, themselves to somebody else and back. And they found that the, while they were processing this, that, the, um, that there was a greater association between the amygdala and the anterior cingulate cortex, which is one of the centers of um, self-reference. And I'd like to um, share some work that we're doing um, and where we're looking at uh, individuals who are suicidal and non-suicidal uh, while they're in an fMRI scanner and asked to think about concepts uh, related to suicide and emotions. And uh, Marcel Just is the neuroimager, a cognitive psychologist who really has developed and pioneered these techniques. Matt Nock and Christine Cha have helped us to uh, select the actual words, and Dana McMakin and Lisa Pan helped us to develop the protocol. And so in a pilot study, we examined uh, 17 young adults with suicidal ideation and 17 healthy controls. 
and we had them think about 30 words, uh, each one for about three seconds, 10 related to suicide, 10 related to positive emotions, and 10 related to negative emotions. And then we used machine learning to discriminate between the groups uh, looking at their activation patterns. And we wanted to see whether we could discriminate ideators from controls. Within the ideators, we wanted to see whether we could identify which of the people had made a suicide attempt. And we wanted to see whether there were distinct emotional signatures associated with those words that discriminated between groups. And this is a list of the words. So you can see that, for example, the suicide words are things like death, fatal, funeral, suicide. And uh, in fact, we were able to discriminate ideators from controls uh, with a pretty high degree of um, accuracy. The words were not just related to suicide, although the single strongest discriminator was death. And the areas of the brain that were differentially activated tended to be those that are involved in self-reference. And we also looked within the ideated group. So again, this is quite a small sample, but we were able to discriminate those ideators who had made an attempt from those who had not. And again, death was the leading candidate and it was the same, uh, it was a subset of the same uh, brain regions that were differentially activated. And here you can see um, two suicide related words and the pattern of activation in two uh, brain areas that were um, are associated with uh, self-concept with a greater activation to death and to lifeless in the attempters compared to the other ideators. And this just shows you where in the brain these different uh, regions were differentially activated. We also found that the degree of the degree to which a person deviated from the average of the healthy controls uh, activation pattern that was correlated with the severity of suicidal ideation. And I came across this study that examines uh, people being treated with CBT for depression. And um, to my knowledge, it's one of the only studies that's directly studied self-referential thinking. And they asked them to consider emotionally related words and ask whether they referred to them or not. And what they found was that uh, effective CBT resulted in a decrease in the association between the medial prefrontal cortex and the anterior uh, cingulate cortex, which is the opposite of the finding that Alarcon had showing that greater connectivity in this area was related to uh, suicidal ideation and behavior. And so in this case, uh, a decline in, in connectivity in the related to self-referential thinking was related to a decline in depression. And so what we can see is that there's a very robust uh, relationship between self-association or self-preoccupation and suicidal risk that's really seen at multiple levels from the way people use language to changes in connectivity and activation on the fMRI to um, using the implicit association test. And it raises the question about whether uh, therapies, um, most of the therapies that we use indirectly affect this, but we rarely target this directly. Uh, one exception to that is uh, the intervention that's a, a game developed by Joe Franklin, who was at the time a graduate student of Matt Knox, called Therapeutic Evaluative Conditioning, in which um, the game was to have somebody get points when they paired uh, words related to self to images that were positive and words or uh, pictures related to suicide with pictures that were disgusting. And actually, uh, in, in three separate clinical trials, uh, they demonstrated that while people were engaging in this game, they showed a dramatic reduction in self-harm, suicidal ideation, and suicidal behavior. And so, um, I think what we can see is that there's really um, a uh, complex interplay between cognitive social uh, system arousal and, and negative valence systems uh, as targets and markers of improvement. And I might say that I think the current state of the art research is to try to identify mechanisms of action and therapy that are 
the a change in connectivity or activation. But it seems to me that the psychotherapeutic techniques that we're using now involve a sequence of domain uh, uh, activation of domains and contract uh, constructs compared to one static target, and therefore we need if we want to study these interventions, uh, we need something with good temporal resolution. The flip side may be maybe we need interventions that don't rely on activating so many different subsystems because if you think about it, you know, if you're 90 percent effective in eight different subsystems, you're going to end up with a 40 percent response rate. And so um, I think both for treatment development and for taking apart and understanding the mechanisms of the treatments that we're now doing, RDOC can be quite useful. And one common theme that I believe we need to think about more is the salience of self-referential thinking, particularly with respect to association between self and death or suicide as one promising target. Uh, thank you for your attention. Um, I'd like to thank you know my uh, my uh, collaborators on the study that um, I presented, Marcel and Matt particularly, and NIMH for funding uh, us, and uh, for Becca Price, Jay Fournier, and Danny Pine who provided some feedback about these slides. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Brent. We're now gonna go ahead with questions and I appreciate everyone who's uh, shared questions. We're going to start, uh, we, we don't have time to do all of the questions, but um, we'll try to get as many as we can. And there are some that kind of touch on themes we can do in various ways throughout. Uh, so bear with us and we'll go till um, uh, 145 about. The first question, uh, is, and I'm going to start with uh, you, Dr. Friedman Hill. Um, you suggested that biomarkers could be used to predict whether a person was at risk for suicide or whether a given treatment would be effective for, for uh, him or her. Uh, can you comment on how group findings permit predictions at the individual level, as you've suggested? Right. So in precision medicine, we, um, we are hoping to emphasize uh, risk factors for individuals, but that doesn't mean that the tradition of um, studying uh, 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 groups of, of, of subjects is still not informative. So for example, um, by stratifying um, and looking at uh, comparisons between groups in our translational research, it gives us clues, um, the between group differences, gives us clues to what we might want to look at in individual um, study participants or patients. But as Matt Nock pointed out, um, the, the key about risk is that it's not um, continuous or um, uh, stable, it's a dynamic process. And what we're really interested in is not just identifying patients who are at risk for making a suicide attempt, but we're interested in knowing patients who are at high risk um, when is their risk the greatest? So we want to understand proximal risk, not just who's at risk, but when they might be um, at the most risk. And um, this is actually a great opportunity for me also to point out that um, inspired by um, the review analysis from Matt Nock and his colleagues, um, and a workshop that we held a few years ago, we actually did, um, uh, we, just, we released this year a funding opportunity to look at the arousal system and uh, how it um, uh, uh, contributes to proximal risk. Um, and those applications have been received. We've had review and we're looking forward to making some decisions about um, the funding for those applications. So um, to just sum up, we're still interested in uh, between group comparisons, but ultimately we need to identify risk processes for that um, over time, the temporal dynamics that for individuals will identify periods of particular high risk. Uh, thank you. Um, Dr. Nock, uh, do you have anything to add uh, along those yeah. lines? Same, same question. Sure. I agree with, with everything that uh, Daisha said. Um, for people interested in this, more interested in this, there's some great new work being done by um, Ron Kessler and Rob DeRubis and others 
taking data from existing treatment trials and trying to understand who is going to respond best to that treatment or to those, to those treatments. And to use a concrete example, and that Ron Kessler has used, uh, Stacia talked about caring, caring letters and caring texts. People, perhaps, who feel more isolated from others might respond better to being reached out to in a caring text intervention where those who don't feel isolated and their thoughts about suicide are, are uh, driven by other, other, other factors might not respond as well. So as she described, precision, precision medicine approaches are trying to identify what factors in which people present at baseline when a person presents a treatment might tell us which is the best treatment for them. So I mentioned those just some concrete examples that are happening in the literature right now. And her second point, as I heard it was, I think, equally as, as important one, which is these factors may change over time. So we have to better model risk and risk factors dynamically. Some things are, are going to be time and varied, of course. Some things like social connectedness are going to vary over time. So it's which interventions work for which people at which time point. And I think with advances in technology uh, and monitoring, we're going to get better and better at uh, doing that, tailoring that precision. Uh, thank you. Do Dr. Brent, anything to comment along uh, those lines going from the group level to the individual level? Just the, the idea of what, that we're talking about looking at moderators of, of treatment response, and once you are able to identify those, you can use those to develop a profile for who's going to respond best to, to what, and as Matt said, as well as when. Uh, thank you. Okay, uh, next question. This is a very applied question, and and uh, I'll talk. I'll start with directing this at you, Dr. Nock, but others can chime in. Uh, this uh, attendee writes uh, that they are they are a school counselor, and they've noticed that social media and video games are a big part of the students' lives. And this uh, came to mind as Dr. Nock, you were talking about escape mechanisms, mm -hmm. and the person wondered if these kinds of social media video games can be a type of, um, you know, escape mechanism. And how does RDoc relate to, you know, uh, this context? Any, any thoughts? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. Uh, I think, that, I think the escape process, so, so the desire or the bias to try and escape from an adverse situation, is one that drives a lot of forms of psychopathology. I don't know, and I don't, I don't know exactly where or how I would see it in the current RDoc matrix, but I do think it's a really important process that in our work, work so far seems to be an important driver for things like not only suicide, but non-suicidal self-injury, uh, eating pathology, alcohol and substance use. This idea that some people have a, a increased tendency to feel, uh, feel bad, have these really aversive thoughts and feelings, and they engage in behaviors that can uh, alleviate that, whether it's through cutting or burning or drinking or drugging or controlling or eating, or maybe through using social media um, or video games or something else as a, as a means of escape. I think we have to better understand it and try and better understand the mechanism. Once, once you see that it's involved, how is it involved? How is it working? Is it through escape? Is it through um, creating a connectedness to others? Uh, re the, re you know, the, re removing the bad feelings, generating positive ones. I think a lot of important questions in there that can help give us traction. Uh, and I think the way to go, as I tried to highlight my talk, is doing some more basic science to understand well what are the potential um, factors involved. How do we how do we study this in a more concrete way, and then bring that out into the field once we identify some some levers and start turning them to see are there healthier things we can have people do rather than cutting and burning and, and using social media or video games in a harmful way to try and um, drive down uh, the aversive safety and the experiences. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Brent, we'll go to you next. Uh, do you have any thoughts on the same question? By the way, I'll go to each of you in turn, but you don't necessarily have to comment if you don't have anything to add. Uh, Dr. Brent, anything on the social media video game escape question? So. I, I don't know about the escape component. It's it's very. I think one of the problems that has plagued research on social media is that most of it's cross-sectional, and so it's difficult to tell whether the you know difficulty in mental health that people have is causing them to use it more or vice versa. But the longitudinal data, just such as it is, seems to suggest that uh, greater use is associated with um, 
more psychopathology. And the mechanisms, one is that kids are cyber bullied. Another is that they're using it at a time where it's interfering with their sleep. And then kids engage um, in social comparison and, um, and presenting a, a persona that's not accurate. And people have found that the more that their true persona deviates from that which they're presenting, the, the more difficulties that they have. And interestingly, the area that seems to um, moderate the impact of social media on kids' mental health is parental monitoring. That the degree to which parents are involved and set limits uh, and maybe help kids interpret what they're experiencing is, uh, is protective against the effects of negative effects of social media such as we understand them now. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Friedman Hill, anything to add? Sure, I wanted to go back um, to um, some things Matt said about escape. So just thinking off the top of my head about the RDoC matrix, I think um, some of the constructs that could help us unpack what's involved in escape would be in the positive balance in, uh, for example, reinforcement learning, understanding reward valuation, um, additionally, um, for behaviors actually like cutting, um, there's a, a component of habit learning, so the new sensory motor uh, dom uh, domain uh, may be helpful as well. I also think that escape um, really underscores the fact that these domains and these constructs um, really interact. So um, again, distress tolerance, stress responses interact with reward and reinforcement learning and habit learning. And so it's really necessary to um, use, look at multiple constructs uh, to understand and unpack these, um, these phenomena. Thank you. Uh, we probably only have time for one more question. We got a lot of great questions and it's hard to choose, but let's field this one. And then um, again, the webinar will be archived so you can watch it uh, offline. This uh, last question deals with the translation from uh, identifying through screenings to treatment. And, and the question is, if we, if we have biomarkers or we have other you know, means like you've all discussed, to identify people who are at higher risk for suicide in ways other than their self-report, what happens if you get people who are identified at high risk but aren't, aren't reporting any ideation? Uh, what, what do you think we do in that case? And um, Dr. Nock, why don't you, would you mind starting and answering, giving a, sh a shot at that question? I'd be happy to start, but I'm not going to have a good answer because we really don't know in my mind. And we're actually doing a, a, a study right now to try and find this out. Uh, the project I'm doing with um, Jordan Smaller and Ben Rice at Harvard Medical School and others. Basically, in, in this work, taking uh, information from people's electronic health records and using machine learning algorithms to identify people at risk for suicide attempts. And we can identify right now about a third to 40% of attempters a few years before they make their attempt. Great. It turns out that we have a huge percentage of those folks who are false positives. They never go on to make a suicide attempt in the time that they're monitored. So it brings up a really ethical uh, challenge or in terms of what do you do? Do you tell someone they're at risk when really they might not be? And it might be they're not yet thinking about suicide, but they are going to. So that in that case, you'd want to intervene, uh, I think. It might be that they're never going to think about suicide. And so we wonder, might there be some kind of iatrogenic or harmful effect to telling someone that statistically they're at risk for suicide when really they're not? And so we're doing studies now to try and figure out uh, exactly, to, to take a more empirical approach and figure out, well, what things can we do and what is the outcome of the things that we try in terms of uh, informing clinicians about this risk, informing patients themselves. So hopefully the next few years we'll have uh, a better answer. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Friedman Hill, do you wanna take a stab at that question? So I think that's a really interesting question. And like Dr. Nock, um, I think I would uh, need more time for a very thoughtful answer. But um, some initial uh, thoughts is that in mental health uh, care, we are usually directing care at those who are help seeking. Um, but one thing that NIMH has recognized is that there's opportunities um, to ask questions and uh, potentially identify individuals who may be seen in a medical setting 
that wasn't related to a suicide attempt. So we have um, research studies and protocols now for questionnaires that can be administered in the emergency room. Um, not just for individuals who may have come in because of a suicide attempt. We also um, need to recognize that um, there are um, um, suicide attempters. Um, some of them are already being seen. Um, um, they're already in the healthcare system. So we have some efforts um, that are mining electronic health records to also identify risk factors. So we do have opportunities um, and now we have some tools for, um, for surveys that we can use um, that maybe uh, will help um, identify individuals who might not necessarily before be help seeking. Sounds great. Uh, Dr. Brent, you get the last word. Anything to add on this question? Well, I think we'll, we're working on a paper now that may give us some answers that Matt's also involved in. Uh, I'm working with Cheryl King and others in a large uh, screening project in pediatric emergency rooms. And one of the things that we did is we administered the, the implicit association test to uh, around 2,000 adolescents that we have follow-up on. And the paper we're attempt calling implicitly suicidal, usually my titles don't really get to the final stage. The editors don't seem to have much of a sense of humor. but the, but what we want to do is see, identify there's going to be a subgroup of people that screen positive on the IAT but deny suicidal ideation. And so we want to know, like, well, what are the characteristics of those people and what happens to them compared to, you know, people who are discordant in the other way or are concordant. And so I would say, you know, within the next few weeks, um, we should have some interesting information and some interesting clues about exactly what those people are like. Thank you. We are unfortunately out of time, but uh, I want to thank again our, our panelists, Dr. David Brent, Dr. Stacia Friedman-Hill, and Dr. Dr. Matthew Nock. Uh, as I said, this webinar will be archived later on, so you can check back uh, on the NIMH website. Uh, also, we're very excited to keep this conversation going. One of our goals with the Delaware Project is to facilitate communication, again, in the interest of integrative intervention science. And I think this has been a huge success in that regard. So thank you, panelists. Thank you, audience. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.